Hello, my name is Jonah Albert and I am one of the library's cultural events producers and I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you for joining us for this special event. Rob Berkeley will be speaking to Dr. Eddie Glaude about his new book, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and his urgent lessons for today. But before we get going with the event proper, I do have a couple of points of housekeeping for you. Just above the video, you will see a tab that will enable you to buy Dr. Glaude's book. Also, there's a tab for you, for you to provide us with feedback. Your feedback is really important to us. The British Library has been doing digital events throughout the lockdown, and it'd be really good to, for us to know what you think of it. Um, you can also donate to the British Library. The British Library is a charity. Below the video is an opportunity for you to send questions to Dr. Glaude um, by filling out the question form. So just have a quick look down there and um, do send us your questions um, throughout the event. A few of them will be put to Dr. Glaude um, towards the end of the event. I'd like to extend a very, very special welcome to um, to members of the LKN network, the Living Knowledge Network, a network of libraries across the UK. Welcome guys, thank you so much for joining us. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator for the evening, Rob Berkeley. He's a former director of the race equality think tank, the Runnymede Trust, and he's a director of the gay men's community journalist platform and multi-aid collective called Blackout UK. He's a former advisor to the BBC and Labour Party on strategy, and is currently a trustee of Doc Society, Bearing Foundation and Riverside Studios. Welcome, Rob Berkeley. Thanks, Jonah. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with this discussion. Uh, it's LGBT History Month, um, but we're not bound by months. This is an important discussion to have at any time. Um, and I'm really pleased to be able to uh, introduce Professor Eddie Glaude, uh, who's professor at Princeton University, the James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor, professor uh, and Chair of African American Studies there. Um, uh, a writer that will be known to many of you, um, particularly for Democracy in Black, uh, how race still enslaves the American soul. Um, but we're here this evening to talk about uh, this uh, fantastic uh, new uh, tome, Begin Again, uh, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Today. Um, as a, you can see I've been pulling it with notes, uh, because uh, James Baldwin is an, an important figure uh, for my organisation, uh, mm. but also um, just, a, just a, such, a, such a vital voice. So uh, this, uh, this new work is really important uh, because uh, the, finding ways to, to think about James Baldwin's writing um, and his lessons. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm excited about what Professor Gould uh, and that you all uh, will have to say about it. Um, and uh, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions, as, as Jonah uh, said. So, so do, uh, do fill in a uh, question form, because it's great to have as many of you as possible uh, engaged in, in the conversation. So without further ado, uh, over uh, to <laughs> Professor, Professor Gould. What, what, what time is it where, where you are? Oh, it's uh, 2.30. 2.30. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's in the middle of your day. Um, in the middle of the day, indeed. Fair enough. Um, so just uh, a way of introduction, really. Just tell us a little bit about uh, why, why this book and why now. Yeah, I, I, um, I've always been, at least for much of my academic career, uh, smitten with Baldwin. He shapes how I read. So I'm a... I'm, I'm a philosophical pragmatist. I work on John Dewey. Uh, I do the kind of philosophy of American religious history in some ways. And Baldwin has always offered me resources to kind of think differently within the pragmatist tradition. And so he's been in the background of all of my work. You know, in Democracy in Black, he's everywhere. In A Shade of Blue, every chapter except for the last one begins with a quotation you know, an epigraph of, of Baldwin's work. Um, and 
so I, I wanted to write this intellectual biography on it, but the archives are, are, aren't very uh, robust at this point uh, because much of it is art, you know, em embargoed for the next 30 years. Right? So you can't write that definitive biography uh, of him. And my editor wasn't so much interested in uh, a kind of intellectual engagement with the corpus as it were. So um, then the election happened. And I was sitting here, I, I remember just sitting, you know, thinking to myself, white folks have done it again, right? I was like, my goodness, they have done it again. And so I was in, in some ways despairing and disillusioned. And I knew after teaching Baldwin for, you know, 30 years now, that he went through this experience of having to grapple with his own disillusionment. He would say he never despaired, but Baldwin's not telling the truth, right, in that moment. But so, so, I, I, so I decided to return to his corpus, to, to move about through what he called the ruins. And there I found Begin Again, which is my, my way of picking up the pieces in the face of all of this mess that America has unleashed. Quite early on in, in the, uh... In your chapter on, on the lie, you talk about um, whether this is a backlash or not, whether, whether this moment could be described yeah. as a backlash. Um, and it's a word that, that gets used regularly, uh, but you, you suggest it's not a good, a good word to use. Yeah, backlash is, is you know, it, it shifts the blame. It's too, it's too sanitized, right? It's not a, what, is, what else is a backlash? White people are being racist again, right? I mean, what, what is it? I mean, a backlash is so, presumes that someone else actually bears responsibility to what's going on, right? That we've done something wrong that would warrant uh, uh, a return, a reassertion of, of racism. No, 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 no. So I, I, I don't use that language. I actually use the language of betrayal. That there's this ongoing betrayal of American ideals, ongoing betrayal of Christian ideals, ongoing betrayal of, of who we take ourselves to be. And, and, and we have to deal with the consequences of it, every generation, you know? So, so yeah, I, I try to resist the sanitized language of backlash. It, 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 it lets folk off the hook. And I don't try to let anyone off the hook in the book. <laughs> no, definitely not. And, 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 <laughs> um, and the idea of, of, of naming the lie straight away um, mm -hmm. can just really, really struck me as, as a, um, uh, well, it drew, it drew me into the book, certainly. Straight away, I was like, okay, he means me. <laughs> um, but um, it's a lie, and the comparison you're, you're making is about uh, being in, uh, when you say, Walt, Walt Whitman talks about the aftertime. Mm. Is this still an aftertime, or, or, or is it, has it always been an aftertime? Well, you know, after, you know, it's almost, after times is, 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 is Whitman's language, but it's also my way of riffing on, you know, the old blues metaphor of the crossroads, you know, that, that moment where you're in between worlds, right? That something is dying, but something isn't quite come into view yet. And so uh, we're, we're still in that moment, you know, where, where, where we have to, you know, Donald Trump closed the door on something and open and, and ushered in something in some ways. And so part of what, what, what we're facing is an old world is dying and a new world is trying to come into existence and, and the choices that have to be made in this moment, right? Are you gonna take, you know, to echo, to extend the metaphor, are you gonna take the brought, are you gonna take the deal that Robert Johnson did with the devil? Or are you gonna do something else, right? And so, in this instance, we are. I mean, the late Stuart Hall would call it a conjunctural moment, a moment of crisis and a moment of possibility. You know, that's that's where we are. And I, so I just, I think the after times is this moment where, you know, for Whitman, a moment where the nation has fought this war. Uh, 600,000 plus are dead. Carnage, has death has defined the emergence of the, of the modern US nation state. And now the country seems empty to value. The only thing that seems to motivate people is greed. And so Whitman writes democratic vistas as a way of accounting for the vapidness of the, of the moment and what, what is on the horizon and what is behind us. And so I think we are in one at this point, yeah. 
and and during the kind of after time, I mean, which which I mean, I, from from this vantage point, um, you go. America goes from uh, from Obama to Trump, yeah. um, and uh, it feels like uh, the country that we thought we knew from here suddenly um, looks much more foreign, uh, much much mm. more different. Um, and I, I wonder about the what the, what the progressive does at that moment. The person who's who's, who's interested in just what what happens because um, do we hunker down? Do people disappear into university departments and they uh, and they and they try and find a a bolt hole till till, till the storm passes? Um, you didn't choose to do that. You're you're still you're right. still you're still engaging. <laughs> you're still you're still there right. in the ruins. Right, right. You know, in, in some ways, I'm taking my lead from the activists. So in, on one level, when I, when I decided to write the book, it's not only about my despair and my disillusionment, Brother Rob, it's also, it was also at a time when many of the activists in Ferguson were dying. We were getting reports every other day of somebody lynched or someone burned up in a car, or, you know. And, and so I was, I was worried about them. And then, you know, the murder of George Floyd happened eight minutes and 46 seconds, people in the United States and around the globe saw this public lynching. And what emerged was fascinating to them. It wasn't just amazing about the kind of cross section of people um, protesting. But what I realized is that they had, been, they had been organizing all along. That even though the country had elected Trump, Obama's years were behind them they were still in the trenches doing work. So defund the police isn't just some random phrase that just popped out of nowhere. It's actually the language of organizers on the ground who have been trying to pressure municipalities in the United States to budget their values in some ways, right? And so what I, what I realized as I was writing the book and as I was witnessing what I was witnessing um, is that, no, it's not a moment of retreat. It's actually a moment of doing, you know, politics, right? Of, of setting the stage for, for the battle, as it were, the, as it were, the battle to come. Yeah. And, and do you think that, uh, that there is learning between generations, between, uh, because you mm. suggest here that the, the, the Baldwin's in an aftertime uh, and that we're, we're in an aftertime as well. Um, oh, do, are we destined to just repeat the same pattern, or do you think we know? You know, Baldwin has this this wonderful phrase, and I, I know I'm paraphrasing him here. He said, "The horror of America is that it's always changing, but America never changes." <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, so it's supposed to be dynamic, but it's really kind of constantly reproducing. Um, uh, a set of standard assumptions about who's valued and who's not and the like. Uh, what I noticed is that young folk who have been organizing, even in the context of the Obama administration, they were reaching for Baldwin. They were reaching for, Jimmy was everywhere. You know, and no, it's because in some ways, you know, each sentence in his corpus is like a universe unto itself. So he's so quotable. So people are just pulling things out and, you know, as, as, as Baltimore was burning and you had this kind of dual image of, of, of the CVS on fire and Obama calling them thugs, you suddenly an image of this poster, nothing, you know, every, nothing can be changed unless it's face, you know, or power, you know, and ignorance, you know, allied with ignorance. I mean, it's just this wonderful kind of, so he was everywhere. And so I think, you know, young people today, have been trying to imagine a different kind of politics as they confront the rearguard action that is the invocation of Dr. King in the civil, civil rights movement. In the US, I don't know what it's like in, in the UK, but there's always a kind of uh, invocation of what is considered legitimate forms of dissent. And Dr. King is the avatar. So even though these people don't give a damn about King, aren't committed to nonviolence. They will invoke him as a way of containing the radical possibilities 
of Black politics, and they do it over and over again. So sometimes that could result in a kind of knee-jerk reaction against past movements. But what we saw are these, what I saw you know, were these uh, interesting attempts to, to connect, to establish continuity, even in the midst of rupture, if that makes sense. So, uh, I, I, which I think is, um, for me, I suppose I'm just getting used to my kind of gray hair, right? So I'm getting used to, <laughs> to, to not being in that, in that wave of, uh, uh, of, of the young activists. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that, what, what comes across uh, really clearly is that there's a clear concern of yours, but it also was a concern of, uh, of, of James Baldwin to think about the next generation, to spending, mm -hmm. spending time uh, up all night with Stigley Carmichael, as you mentioned. Um, yeah. And, uh, and and using um, and thinking about oh, something, something really powerful. Because I've noted down that um, some one of us should have been there with her. Yeah, about, uh, about, this is Dorothy uh, Counts. This is yeah. Dorothy Counts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I, I think I feel that now as an older, <laughs> as an older activist, yeah. Uh, yeah. I want to be alongside. Um, is there is there something about the intergenerational uh, kind of conversation that uh, that might be the, the key to making sure that the pattern doesn't just repeat itself in the same way? I think so, and and I was deliberate in terms of how I began the book and how I ended it. So outside of an introduction, I begin chapter one with Baldwin in this apartment, chopping it up with these veteran student activist of SNCC. So it's Stokely Carmichael who would become Ma Kwame Ture and Michael Thelwell and Muriel Tillinghast, right? Those students who were members of the National Action Group who had organized in Cambridge, Maryland, who went down into the South and experienced raw terror and Baldwin knew what they had experienced. But I also end the book, right? With me trying to find Jimmy's grave and I can't find it. And there are these group of young, you know, young men right? Brown and black and this smoking loud. I mean, the weed is louder than anything I've ever smelled in my life, right? And it's loud. And I remember, and I write this in the book, because we couldn't find this because it's a sprawling cemetery and we couldn't find, and they were like, well, maybe he's over there with Malcolm, you know, and they're zooted, they're high. And, and so, and I was with David Baldwin's partner, Jimmy's brothers, uh, the what mother of, 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 of David Baldwin's son and Carol Weinstein. And Carol said, no, he's not over there. And so we drive and we come back and Baldwin was right behind the young folk all the time. He was right there. And so part of that framing deliberately was to say the, what's at stake here, what has always been at stake here. And as a reader of Baldwin, you know this, is how do we raise our babies? How do we ensure that they're gonna be all right? And so, and I, I should say this really quickly, Rob, the Elsewhere chapter almost wasn't written uh, because I was supposed to go to Istanbul and folk were like, bruh, you're a critic of Donald Trump. You're gonna go to Erdogan's Istanbul? You've lost your damn mind. And so, so and then the, then, then the State Department issued its warnings and the like. And my editor wanted me to go and interview activists. And I was like, we're always extracting always going to them. Can I write something to them, for them? And that's how the Elsewhere chapter emerged too, so. No, yeah. fantastic. And, and I want to talk a bit about travel because I think that's, uh, yeah. it's, 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 a, well, it's, a, it's a theme of Jimmy's life, but also um, of, of the book. Paris, London, Istanbul. Um, do you have to leave home to, to, to get perspective or? I, it's clear that, that, that Jimmy Baldwin did, but... You have to get some kind of distance, you know? There has to be some kind of distance. Excuse me, sorry. There has to be some kind of distance, the hazards of, uh, of, of home, yeah, right? Absolutely. Uh, so there has to be some kind of distance in the sense that one's relationship to the operations of power can, can become blinkers. Right. You can find yourself so 
uh, ensnared by the way in which the society functions that she can't get the requisite distance to say anything about it critically. And so in this sense, I'm, I'm like, I, I draw on Edward Said and, 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 and Michael Walzer as critics. And there's something about inhabiting what Said would call this exilic space, but all of us can't afford to, to go to London or, or to Istanbul or Paris or, or the like. You damn sure can't travel with $40 in your pocket like Baldwin did in 1948, you know? Um, so what I try to suggest is that we have to figure out even within the spaces we inhabit, right? Even within the country, how to create those that distance by, by really, you know, finding it elsewhere in communities of love that allow you to laugh full belly laughs, to cuss at the top of your lungs, people who got your back when your knees buckle, you know, those communities that aren't reducible to the gaze, that try desperately to exist outside of it. So you need that distance, but you don't necessarily have to leave the country to get it, in my view. Right. Um, one of the results of uh, last summer's uh, demonstrations, um, and it was great to see them happen so globally and, and, and in the UK, they were happening in places that uh, we were surprised now, so coastal towns and, and rural villages and, and people really, uh, with the conjunction of the, of the pandemic as well, uh, have time, to, I think, to, uh, to engage and, and to suggest something about the future they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, but we ended up uh, in a, with the government responding by worrying about statutes. Uh, and uh, a government that's responded by uh, trying to ban critical race theory uh, from, a, <laughs> from our classrooms um, and a government that's responded uh, by, uh, by calling work on uh, addressing racism as, devi as divisive. Um, now we've seen all this before, right? So it's, it's, it's not as if these are new responses. Um, There was, there was a, a moment of mass mobilization um, which seems to have dissipated very, very quickly. Right? Yeah. And I wonder whether, uh, whether it's in elsewhere that we need to find the responses or, or, or uh, can we draw some strength from what, from, uh, what Jim Baldwin uh, did despite his, his uh, uh, is despair, really. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no go ahead. I, I, I I'm no, I, I think, I think, I think. You know, I should say this very carefully. I mean, very, very clearly. Um, America's original sin is not ours alone. It's also yours. You know, I keep saying this. You know, America's original sin is not slavery. It's not the genocide of native peoples. Those are consequences. America's original sin is the belief that white people matter more than others. That's the price of the ticket. And that belief is not our possession alone. And so in these moments, right, when the, col the colonists return to the metropole, right, when, 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 you know, the movements of populations destabilize this idea of what, of who and what the UK is, of who or what, you know, Berlin should be and, or Germany should be, or the demographic system in the United States destabilize this idea that we should be a white nation in the vein of old Europe, there's going to be a reassertion of the lie. Always has been, always will be. Like you said, we've seen it before. Um, and so I think the, the, the explosion in the face of what we saw after George Floyd's murder, right? People had to risk their lives to do that. And since then, over 500,000 are dead in the US. So this is happening in the context of a global pandemic that's decimating Black America. That's decimating Native communities in the United States. Black and brown and poor people are dying disproportionately among that number. And so I don't know if it's dissipating. I think people are trying to survive, right? And just yesterday, just yesterday, Rob, I don't know if you noticed, but they, they acquitted, they decided not to charge uh, police officers in Rochester, New York, who put a hood over a man who was having a mental health crisis 
and 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 basically killed him. So they said he didn't die of asphyxiation. And if you believe that, I got a cheap apartment in in in, in London to, to to sell you, right? But 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 the whole point is that we're still the the celebrate. I mean, the anniversary of Ahmad Arbery's uh, death was just this week, right? His mother is still grieving. So the reality that police are still killing us that's not gone away. It's just that folks are trying their damnedest to stay alive in the midst of a pandemic that's wiping us out. And that's just, that's just real talk in some, on a certain level. No, completely. And I suppose my, uh, I suppose the despair that I, the, 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 that I experience as a result of, you know, of going back to, to the barricades time and time again, um, it, it needs, uh, at least some kind of uh, soothing, some kind of balm, right? In order mm-hmm. to to deal with um, what you describe as as, as the, the trauma, you know, I, I think you, you do that uh, incredibly well to to think about uh, to think about trauma, but not be overwhelmed by it. Um, mm. uh, is 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 a clear part of the challenge of any any kind of activism. Um, I've got, I've got to talk about the Obamas, um, and, and <laughs> uh, in, in part because uh, I, I suppose we, we uh, great admiration for 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 his skills as an orator and a, um, but it's far easier to love from this distance than uh, than he may have been uh, in America. I mean, what? What happened there? I mean, what what happened in terms of uh, you know the the way in which you, which the Obama story seems to be co opted into the lie? Well, it makes sense though. You know, I mean, this is the very way in which rep, you know representation works in these places. You know, if you have an uncritical idea of representation, right, it can be literally deployed, right, to to arrest any significant changes. In my view. Obama's election has been one of the most devastating events in the history of African-American politics, destabilizing it from the national level all the way down to the state level in various ways. And it has been trying to reconstitute itself over the last you know, few years. And, and in some ways, Trumpism has, has accelerated that effort to reconstitute it after the demobilizing effects of the last of the eight years of Obama's administration. Now, some people will get angry at me for saying it, but I think it's actually true, right? Bob Moses, the great SNCC organizer, told me that one of the interesting things about uh, 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 having electoral processes as the object of one's organizing is that whether victory is attained or defeat, it ends up demobilizing your efforts. Because if you win, yay, and if you lose, ah, right? So you get this, so, so part of what Obama has done, or what he did, or what the Obama phenomenon did, was it wrapped Clintonism in a particular kind of representational politics. And what we got still were a set of policies that tinkered around the edges, but left in place deep wealth inequality. You know, Black Lives Matter didn't emerge, right, under George Bush, it emerged under Barack Obama. Mm-hmm. And we didn't get any substantive legislation that, that fundamentally addressed criminal justice reform. We still, we didn't get any fundamental legislation to address police reform, right? What we got are a series of lectures about how black folk need to be responsible. And da, 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 da. you know, you think about the, you know, the speech at Morehouse or, 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 or the, the, the lectures to, uh, to Black Lives Matter about the nature of politics and what does it mean to compromise and the like, right? So, I think the short answer to your question, and not to personalize it to the Obamas, is to actually say that they represent the dangers of representational politics. Right? It's not enough just to have different bodies right, in high spaces and high places. That's baseline. It's not enough to just have trans, tra- representational forces. You need transformational forces in these places. And to my mind, outside of the symbolic significance, which was important. You know, he wasn't a transformational personality. Let me say this too. My son grew up 
with the Obamas in the White House. He's 24 now. So for eight years of his life, that's, that was the image of his politics, right? But he also grew up with Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Ayanna Jones, Sandra Bland, you know, Casey yeah. Goodson. I can go down the line, right? So the generation that grew up politically with Obama in the White House, they are kind of, I like to call them, well, it's not like, I call them the catastrophic generation. Mass shootings, global recession, uh, one, every, one, every, storms that's supposed to happen every hundred years are happening every other month. Credit card debt, student loan debt surpassing credit card debt, global pandemic, economic economy and ta- Obama. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and, and very, very clear. Um, uh, well, just as, as the book was was being published, when uh, the, the I don't know how to describe them, but the but the, the terrorists who tried to take over the capital. Um, yeah, it, it it feels. Um, like beginning again would be a, a, a wise a wise choice if it was but it, if it was simple but clearly you're, you're not saying beginning again is a is, is an easy task no because you know in some ways you know what 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 Baldwin so brilliantly laid bare for us is that the problem isn't us it never has been he says, I'm not an N-word. I've never thought of myself as the N-word. The question is, why do you need the N-word in the first place? And, and you know, and until you answer that question, we will find ourselves here over and over and over again. And so part of part of the, I think part of the challenge of the book is that the spine of it is, is no name in the street. The anchor of the book is Baldwin trying to figure out how to pick up the pieces in the face of all of this trauma, wound, pain, betrayal? How do we continue to push this damn boulder up the hill in the face of the un, unvarnished truth that white people cling to this idea, they cling to this idea that they have to matter more than others? What do we do in the face of that? Right. And one of, one of the things that you suggest is is to tell a different story right um and i we, we've seen from here but we've also had a, a a response in terms of our media uh seeing voices like like michaela cole come forward but also ava duvernay and and, and, yeah. and and others who are who are transforming what television is doing and, and what uh, and what hollywood potentially could do um I don't, how many stories do we need to do, do we need to tell? I mean, we need to saturate with different kinds of stories because we're having it. I mean, you know, to 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 use uh, Ralph Ellison's uh, phrase, on the lower frequencies, we're speaking for you, right? There's a sense in which what's happening at at the level of culture, right, on the ground. This is at the source of this is the source of the terror and panic, right? At least in the United States. I don't know what's happening in the UK, but. You know, people are going on TikTok and seeing all of these interracial couples that they're, they're, they're looking at these racially ambiguous children on, on television commercials. They're hearing sounds. They're seeing the change in aesthetics. Right. They see the brown, quote unquote, the browning of America evidencing itself already in popular cultural forms and in mass media. And they don't know what the hell to do. And so part of what we have to do is begin to narrate. You know, it's like watching, you know, it's like on HBO in the United States and you and you and you you take you're watching the watchman and it begins with Tul- the Tulsa massacre mm-hmm. as the ground of this comic this DC comic right and folk are like what the hell is this right what is that or you watch bl- you know blind you know um, blind spotting or i mean all of the i mean i could just pull up all of these films that are, that have been coming or even Judas and the Messiah you know black messiah we need to tell ourselves different stories. But you know, at the very moment in which we do, guess what they do? They reassert, they, they published the 1776 commission right. in response to the 1619 project. The lie constantly reasserts itself because people, people believe, Rob, I think, and you tell me if I'm wrong. I think at least the white Americans believe 
that without this idea of whiteness, they would be lost, that they would have no identity. And, and I think that's just wrong. <laughs> yeah, of the, the, the urge to impose an identity on another group, uh, to stop the conversation about the, their own identity. Exactly. And, um, but has also made identity much more important. So, mm -hmm. you know, so, so in some ways it's, uh, uh, it feels like a response, doesn't it? It feels like a, a, there's, a, there's a relationship between uh, imposing and uh, closing down the space for other identities to, uh, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. be free. Uh, mm -hmm. That has an impact back on the on, on the oppressor, mm -hmm. um, and, and that that feels very Baldwin. You know? um, yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. I should remind people uh, to ask questions. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I'm sure there are plenty of questions uh, emerging, but um, if you don't get in soon, you may not get in. So it's, it's just that's a, uh, that's a bit of a warning. Um, Well, you've, you've, you've already uh, mentioned this, but uh, who's the book for? Well, I mean, I, like I said, on, on one level, it's for me. On another level, it's for uh, the young activists. And on another level, it's for uh, the America that desperately need, that is desperately trying to be, to be born, you know? I think I think it's those three, yeah. And what I appreciated on, on reading it was that you main, that you, you managed to maintain a level of hope that, that there is a uh, a potential for a new Jerusalem. Uh, actually, yeah. Actually. yeah. Um, and I I wonder. I don't. I don't get that. I don't get that sense of hope uh, in in British politics currently. Uh, but maybe that's just my. <laughs> 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 I mean, that's just my uh, my positioning on it but you've got a new president uh and mm. there's clearly a relationship with the the obama administration and uh, mm. and a lot of of, of, uh, of president biden's initial uh allure is that it's not donald trump mm -hmm. so that's, so that's a, a, a major bonus um indeed but, but also he, <laughs> He has a, it feels quite an avuncular uh, approach, which allows him to, uh, to, to suggest compromise and, and that we should all you know, come together. Yet, yeah. as you said yesterday, courts are, uh, are not making prosecutions. Um, Jacob Blake, uh, another case that's, that's, that, that seems to, uh, leave the police blameless, yeah. um, and I, I wonder how is is the the kind of rhetoric that's coming out of the White House now enough, or, or no. what, people, what people need something else quite soon, or, or, yeah, rather than, or, or will we just see people entrench in these in, in these camps? In these, uh, well, the, look, I. I mean, there are at least four political currents in the United States right now. Uh, the civil war in the Republican Party is what people are, are reporting are reporting about right now. But there is there there remains deep fissures within the Democratic Party, um, and uh, the progressive wing of the party, whatever we might mean by that word, is continuing to bring pressure to bear. Right, um, and we have to understand Joe Biden for who he is. Right. He comes out of that DLC, Democratic Leadership Council, Council kind of crew, right? He is in that vein. But, you know, his inauguration, he used language that I've never heard a president ever use. He used the phrase white supremacy. We'll get, I'll give him that, right? But whenever I, you know, whenever I hear bipartisanship or unity under these certain, under these circumstances, you know, I grab my wallet. I don't know what's going on, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, um, uh, uh, and... You know, he's already, you know, started to bud, I mean, started to cave on, on student loan forgiveness. Uh, there was some willingness, at least he signaled some willingness to give up on, 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 on a living wage, on the fight for 15, on $15 minimum wage. Got a really serious backlash 
push from, from the progressive, the left wing of the party. But look, politicians inevitably disappoint. That's what they do. And if we're gonna change this country, we cannot expect it to happen uh, in the, you know, by way of them. You know, in the US, all of the innovation must happen at the local level. If there's gonna be serious reform of policing, it's gonna to have to happen at the local and state level. If there's gonna be serious reform of, it, of education, it's gonna to have to happen at the local level and the like. So people have to continue to organize. And what we saw in Georgia, what we saw in, in, in Texas at times, uh, they're, they're, the, the demographic shifts are beginning to make themselves known politically in spaces that, that people didn't think were gonna turn until another 10, 15 years down the road. So Biden, look, I don't want us to trade one fantasy for another. Trump, is a fan, Trump was a fantasy. And I don't want Biden and Harris right, to make us, you know, to suddenly we affirm the goodness of America and a republic goes back to sleep. That would be disastrous. Because prepare yourself, he will inevitably disappoint. <laughs> yes, yes. It's a matter of, matter of time, right? It's a matter of time. I, I, I wonder before we, we go to uh, some, of the, sure. some of the questions. Um, really about that, that transition to this new Jerusalem, because I'm, 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 I'm fascinated by, by it, but I'm also really conscious about uh, talk of decolonization that we, we talk about uh, here regularly. Every step is, is, is fought and every step, um, it's clear that people are, would rather talk about uh, public art and statues, would rather talk about, um, uh, would, would, would rather uh, do anything to obfuscate and to suggest that um, the demands for, for change are, are, are unreasonable. Mm. Um, and, I, and I wonder, um, the, uh, the message from the, from the book is about elsewhere, but also about, about different stories. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, I, I wonder uh, how we keep our imaginations uh, primed. How, how is it that we can, uh, can keep dreaming, keep imagining that, that different? Uh, yeah, that's such a great question. And, and I anticipated it, I think, in the book. I use this example, Rob, of, of, of slavery. There's nothing about the condition of slavery that would lead one to believe that one's life could be otherwise. In the, in the US in particular, because of the domestic reproduction of slavery, right? But there, there are these moments, right? So if you're gonna avoid a certain kind of Afro-pessimist conclusion, right, that social death defined the slave relationship, that the, the relation of domination is so total, that the slave is socially dead, which you really can't make sense of given what, what these enslaved people did after the end of slavery. Many of them just started walking, trying to find loved ones. Right? Going, I'm walking to Alabama. My sister was sold. I need to try to find her. My mother was sold. I need to try to find her, right? Um, but in that moment of, of, of the opacity of one's condition, you look in the eye of someone and just for a moment, you see deep love or you hear just for a moment, the sound of children, of the innocence of children in, in the play. Even though you know the brutality of the regime is what it is, you see the love in the eyes, the flit of love in the eyes, the sound of innocence. And then that become, becomes an interesting sort of way, the conditions for the possibility of imagining one's life beyond this. It is, it is those, those experiences become experiences that help, that stand in the breach that keep you from succumbing to a certain kind of fatalism. So here we are in this moment, and Baldwin is always insisting on this, right? And that is, we gotta raise our babies in this. I can't, he'll even, even when he's exaggerated, I can't give up on, I can't despair. I can't be a writer if I despair. He'll say it that way. Or he'll say, right, we gotta raise our babies. And so what do we see him do in these moments? He says, and in 1970, he said it. He said it in such a profound way, but you know, and he, he had just tried to commit suicide in 69. He's in Istanbul in 70. The Ebony reporter asks him about hope. 
and he drops that gem. Hope is invented every day. And so, and I keep explaining it to people, Rob. I said, if you got to invent hope every day, that means you're trying to hold off despair every day. So you have to figure out how to swing your feet off the bed and plant it on the ground, plant it on the floor and get up. Getting up is a hopeful act in some ways, right? Yeah. And so, so Baldwin, for me, right, um, has this undying faith in our capacity, your and my capacity to be otherwise, even as he recognizes that we are disasters at the same time. And that's where the hope is located. That's where the possibility of the new Jerusalem can be found in the fact that we can be, you know, as, as messed up as we are, we can actually be miraculous at times. Fantastic. Which is a perfect place to, to turn to the questions from, from, from <laughs> um, I, should, I, should, I should definitely remember that, that as a, that as, as, as a, uh, as a way of, of, of framing uh, that, that's fantastic. Uh, right, mm. so um, we've got uh, oh, numerous questions. I, I'm gonna just go with the, the top one. Uh, sure. And this is a British Library after all. So Farrah <laughs> Karen Cooper, uh, Farrah asks, what would James Baldwin say about decolonizing literature? Uh, it's just thinking, in particular about Shakespeare. Uh, what would he say to those who think Shakespeare should no longer be taught? Oh, no. First of all, I don't want to anticipate anything that Jimmy would say, right? Who would, who would dare do such a thing? What would Jimmy say about this? And da, da, da. There's over 7,000 pages of work. But, but in uh, Randall Keenan's uh, wonderful book, The Cross of Redemption, there's an essay that actually speaks directly to this, right? And it's titled, Why I Stopped Hating Shakespeare. Right. <laughs> so I would urge you to read that and then you can get a sense of what Jimmy actually thinks about it. But there's a sense in which Baldwin, even in No Name in the Street, he's going to say we at least have to have the moment where we are, where where we can reject these folks. You can't stuff the West down my throat like Gerber's baby food. I've had to had I've had to go through my moment of rejecting Walt Whitman such that I could read him for myself and possess him on my own terms. Just because it's your history, just because you determine that it is great, doesn't mean that I must accept it as such. So my reading of Shakespeare must come organically from my embrace of him. And Baldwin tells this story about how he came to understand the greatness of the bard, as it were. Uh, but that's, that's really important, it seems to me, in terms of this public history, this public memory debate that we're having, not only here in the States, but at the, in the UK as well. Uh, question from Giselle, who, uh, it's a big question, Giselle. Uh, <laughs> there are lessons to learn. Uh, do you think anything has improved uh, since uh, last year's demonstrations? Uh, I'm assuming she's thinking about um, mm. after George Floyd and uh, Fiona Taylor's and, and Tony McDade's murders. Um, uh, and secondly, mm. in bigger terms, how do we solve racism? Do we use legislation? Uh, uh, will capitalism do it? Or is there something about uh, shaming of, uh, of racists? Oh, sh well, that's the, that last part is easy, you know. Um, Donald Trump was in so many ways, just as your, just as your prime minister is, you know, shame doesn't work <laughs> at all, okay. at all. So let's, let's just put that aside. Um, um, even the moral shaming of the civil rights movement only took us so far. Um, um, and, and that was the notion of redemptive suffering. So, so let me ask you the first part, you know, uh, first uh, as it were. And, 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 and it seems to me that we, there, the judgment is still out about where we are. We've already seen, the, we've already heard the language of turning the page, of unity, of appeals to bipartisanship, right? Uh, of allowing, very, allowing those who literally, literally engaged in insurrection, 
who who and I'm thinking about the Josh Hollies and 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 the Ted Cruz's and and the Republican Party, um, Donald Trump and all these folks who literally stoked the fires of insurrection to continue to have a say in 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 how how this country is governed, um, just baffles the mind on a certain level. But um, the, I could say I will say that that there is an opening for improvement. That's a that's a different way of answering. There's an opening. How, what it will look like will depend upon what we do now. So that's the answer to the first part. The second part is how do we eradicate? It's going to be a range of. Remember that what we have to do is to um, up. We have to finally get rid ourselves of the value gap. This belief that white people are valued more than others organizes our social, political, and economic lives. We have to uproot the habits that sustain it. And we have to discard the lies that allow us uh, 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 to believe that we're innocent of, of, of its deleterious effects. How we're going to do that, we're gonna to have to tell different stories. So we're gonna to have to re-narrate. We're gonna to have to do it via policy because remember policy, policies produce the world that we live in. So policies must be the remedy to the world we live in, at least at, at the level of structures. So it's gonna be a combination of folks, but at the, a combination of things, but at the end of the day, it's gonna be everyday ordinary people demanding a new world. It's gonna be us doing that work. Um, Jimmy was always really clear about, well, that's always really clear, but it's certainly a, a, <laughs> a, a, an understanding of his role as a poet, as a... As a uh, yeah. Um, and uh, there's a question uh, by the Learn Knowledge Network from Jess, who asks, uh, who is today's poet of the revolution? Um, who do you think is writing to document our struggles as powerfully uh, as James Baldwin did? Well, you know, there's, you know, that 1962 piece he wrote entitled As Much Truth As One Could Bear. Baldwin was engaged in this kind of um, impious act as one of the new young writers, you know, describing the shadow cast by Das Passos and Faulkner and all of those folks. And he says, you know, um, uh, the simple truth to be a, a great novelist is that you must tell the truth, tell the truth. And as much as he said, tell the truth as much as we tell as much of the truth as we can bear and then a bit more. Um, so I, I don't want to sound impious that, you know, I'm writing a book with Baldwin. I think he's wonderful. I think he's great, but I don't want to use him as the measure for who's tr truth telling today. We don't need today's James Baldwin. We need today's Sarah Broom. We need today's Imani Perry. We need today's, um, Ibram Kendi. We need today, you know, you know, though I think, I think, there are, there are a host of, of writers in the US and I, and, I, and I suspect in the UK and in Canada, I, I'm sure, who are doing some extraordinary work uh, around this issue. Uh, I have some of them up on my shelves now. Um, and uh, they're, they're, they have their own voices. But you know, the moment we name someone as the new Baldwin, think about what has happened to Ta-Nehisi Coates. And you read, I read quotes and I would, I would think, oh my God, Jimmy would lose, lose his mind reading Between the World and Me, right? He would, he would, he would be horrified uh, by the conclusions drawn in me, in, in, well, let me say it differently. I'm horrified by, <laughs> by the conclusions drawn uh, in Between the World and Me, you know? But uh, that's how I would begin to answer that question. But there are a lot of poets out there who are doing some amazing work in the broad sense of what we mean by poets. Yeah, completely, uh, including at uh, the inauguration. Right? That, that's, uh, uh, mm. Oh, uh, Amanda Gorham, right, Amanda, exactly. Amanda Gorham. Yeah, yeah, just exactly. amazing. Um, uh, there was a question that that, that, uh, that emerged when I, I, I told my uh, colleagues at Blackout that I was uh, yeah. speaking to, you. and that, that's about uh, uh, James Baldwin's sexuality and how that has a, uh, and how that shaped his, his thinking and, 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 and his writing, and whether, in some ways, uh, that notion of being having a minority sexuality uh, mm. may have helped get that distance, find his elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, such, 
it's one of my biggest regrets with Begin Again. Um, and in some ways I was being a little too deferential to, 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 to Baldwin. You know, it's like that moment in the short film from another place as he's describing, you know, I've loved uh, men and women. And he's, he has the, uh, you know, the, 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 the Muslim prayer beads as he's moving. It's a beautiful scene. Uh, with his gorgeous, gorgeous hands. And he's, he's, he's making, he's, he's basically stating that he has this kind of Puritan commitment to the privacy of his own, of his own love life, right? You know, he makes this moment. And then there's, there are these moments in the last interview with Quincy Troop, where he's being interviewed by, by some gay activist in, in the United States. And he's, and, and the activist doesn't understand how Baldwin's destabilizing the categories that the activist is trying to fix him in. And so what I tried to do in, in Begin Again was to, to figure out how sexuality, how Baldwin's sexuality could become part of the oxygen of the book, not a kind of theorized element in the account, but just a part of his life. So there are moments, King, King is uncomfortable, right? Eldridge Cleaver doesn't understand. Baldwin understood in the context of the South that relationship between sex and power and desire and the like. Um, but Baldwin's misfittedness is at the heart of it all. Right? He, I say it, I put it this way, and I, and I know for older generation folk, they get, they get upset about this language, but Baldwin queers every space he inhabits, right? He throws it in different, a different kind of relief, Rob, it seems to me. He queers black politics, he queers, uh, uh, black literature. And when I remember interviewing Angela Davis about this, she was like, in so many ways, Eddie, he was out there all by himself. So, you know, you just think about it. The, the second book is Giovanni's Room, the second novel. After dropping Go Tell It on the Mountain, you're going to drop Giovanni's Room in 1956? Yeah. I mean, so, so, so I think, so the short answer to the question is absolutely, right? But it's, it's complicated, the way in which Baldwin renders it, whether we're reading The Male Prison or whether we're reading Freaks and the American Ideal of Manhood, right? Um, it's complicated. And I, and I didn't quite, I couldn't quite figure it out narratively in the book. And, and I, I should take every hit known to man for it. <laughs> If that makes sense. Uh, uh, there, there are others who've, who've done far worse. Uh, and, and, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I I really appreciate it, in fact, the, the, for example, the, the, the story that you, you bring to light about uh, the assault that you, you experienced. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but it's, it's like that moment in, I have, in I'm Not Your Negro, you know, there's a moment in the film, because, you know, I love, as much as I love Raul Peck, I mean, it's just completely redacted from the film. Yeah. So he gonna, you're going to find out, he's going to find out that Medgar Evers is, has been killed and he's driving and put, well, he's in the car with Lucian, right? I mean, come on. I mean, what are we going to do with these things? But I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. No, 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 no at all. <laughs> I, I, I suppose I would, um, as somebody who works in, with a group who, who are trying to, uh, trying to reappraise uh, and certainly to unearth the history that, that's been hidden. Um, mm, it's yeah, just, it's important that uh, uh, we don't ignore. Uh, oh, absolutely! Not. And part of again uh, the the way in which I was trying to grapple with it is how do I make it, you know, because you know, Baldwin is so ahead of his times, right? You know, he's already reaching for a language of and androgyny. Uh, you know, he would be he he. I think he would. You know, he, the way in which we use our pronouns. Right. It fits precisely with how he's trying to destabilize these categories, right? Non-gender conforming, right? He, they're, they're languages that we have that weren't available to him, but we have them precisely because of what he did yeah. and how he did it, if that makes sense. Fantastic. I, we're, we're, we're running out of time. In fact, oh, I'm, Lord, I'm uh, sorry. I'm no, running no, out no, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's, been, it's, been, it's been great. It's been, I've, I've been enthralled. I'm sure we could, we could go on for for hours, but I'm sure you've got other things that you need to get off with this afternoon. Um, I, I just want to say thank you um, from, from me for, for, for this book. Um, and uh, a reminder that uh, 
it's got slightly different screens than, than I think everyone else has, but it, if you uh, press on the tab, you can buy a copy of this. Um, I would suggest that you do. Uh, thank you. And uh, and thanks for the, for the conversation. It's been it's been uh, enlightening and uh, infusing and uh, and all the things that are, that are the conversation about uh, about James Baldwin uh, and our thank current you. politics should be. So thank you so much. much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so I think I need to turn back to Jonah. Jonah, right? Yeah. Thank you very much, Rob Berkeley, and also a very special thank you to our very special guest, Dr. Eddie Claude. Thank you, our lovely audience, for joining us this evening, and a very special thank you to those of you from the Living Knowledge Network who joined us from libraries across the UK. Do remember to send us your feedback. Your feedback really is important to us. And do have a look at the bookshop tab, which will offer you an opportunity for you to get hold of Dr. Glaude's book. If you want to find out more information about other events we've got coming and we've got planned, then have a look at the British Library What's On pages on our website. Once again, thank you guys so much for being with us this evening. Thank you.